This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Good morning. This is Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and you are currently tuned in to Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. This is our program that's produced locally that gives you a chance to call in with any questions you might have about your own health or the health of someone near and dear to you. You can reach us live this morning by calling one eight seven seven mpb ring that's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. If you're not able to reach us by phone, you can always send us an email, and that email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. You might also want to check out our website, mpbonline.org, and search for Southern Remedy or any of the other programs that are produced on MPB Think Radio. Uh, you can catch those, and uh, we certainly archive Southern Remedy uh, within about 24 hours. So if you've missed something on the program, have to dart away for a task or something that you're doing at work, uh, just feel free to go back and listen to that at your leisure. We also have a podcast, if you're interested in that, where you can uh, listen to any of the Southern Remedy uh, programs. So those are some resources for you. Uh, we try to get as much information out there for you. Uh, I know everybody's uh, heard in the news, unless you've been really fortunate to camping out in the woods somewhere without any kind of access, uh, we certainly are hitting a huge wave of COVID in the state. Uh, second uh, day in a row that we're over 3,000 new cases. Unfortunately, that's 25 new deaths. Um, we have about 1,400 people in the hospitals of our state uh, right now that are COVID positive, um, and about uh, 200 and I'm sorry, 370 uh, some odd patients that are in an ICU. About 230 of those are on a ventilator. So this is a critical time for healthcare resources in the state. Um, we are have reached a point actually where we are unable to. Uh, provide resources, not just for COVID patients, but other patients. So that means that if you have a heart attack or a stroke or uh, a major accident that requires some uh, assistance that's related to trauma, um, there might be delays in that now just because of the influx. So uh, that's one of the reasons why state officials and experts uh, throughout the state have been saying, you know, look, this is a serious matter. Um, we do recommend that you get vaccinated. It is not too late to do that. Um, if you want more information, there's certainly a lot uh, that's been put out there, particularly by the Mississippi State Department of Health. Um, we are also have our own resources at the University of Mississippi Medical Center um, about uh, some of the concerns that you might have to make a choice for yourself and your family. Uh, but it is the most effective way for both preventing infection, even with the Delta variant. Uh, and then even more importantly, if you do get sick with COVID, uh, it prevents some of the more serious complications. So of all those hospitalized patients, the vast majority of those uh, were not vaccinated and particularly the ones who've had more of the severe infection. So uh, that's a lot. In our own institution, we've got about 125 patients that are admitted uh, to the hospital um, and um, 25 or so of those are children now. So we have seen a, an influx of kids in a way that we didn't with some of the earlier variants. So be careful out there. I would, uh, you know, I'm an advocate for masks. Masks can decrease transmission. There's some good studies on that. They're safe. Uh, they've been used for over 100 years to help prevent infections uh, in the operating suites and operating rooms around the world um, if they certainly, if I know all the my surgery friends, if they, they didn't have to wear that mask all day when they're working in the OR, they wouldn't, uh, but they are totally safe to use and decrease the transmission, both if you have COVID and if you don't have COVID and around somebody. So um, I believe in both of those being very strong ways that we can fight this with the ultimate goal of decreasing COVID in our population and all of its downstream effects, not just the health effect, uh, the health effects from it, but also the 
economic effects and uh, the educational effects. Certainly, it's been difficult. Um, you know, many of you know my, I have a role in education here at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and uh, we certainly would want in-person learning to continue, and these are some ways for it to do that. So that's my advice on that um, for, for COVID. Certainly, if you have any questions, ask your physician about that. I know a lot of them have, you know, have been busy, but uh, there's, there's plenty of interaction to, to get the data that you need to make the best uh, decision for yourself and your family. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We've got um, an email here um, from a listener. She says, Dr. Stewart, my mother was in the hospital twice this spring with coronavirus. She has diabetes, high blood pressure, and poor circulation, but she still works. She suffered some lung damage and has been on oxygen, but is reducing the use of that. She says her, uh, her doctor um, uh, told her not to be vaccinated, uh, but I support the theory that she, uh, uh, based on the, the uh, theory that she has, quote, natural antibodies. I couldn't believe it when she told me, since all the news is that natural immunity is insufficient and wanes fairly rapidly, is this legitimate advice? From what I read and hear, uh, this this might be not uh, some bad advice that she's been given. I, I would agree with this listener. So, uh, and again, there's some misinformation even among physicians, I think, who aren't um, versed and haven't looked at all the data supporting um, vaccinations and, and particularly as it relates to COVID. So what we know about patients who have gotten COVID they do have, most of them have some immunity, but it is variable. Uh, the severity of your infection doesn't always um, give you a, um, uh, you know, an immunity that's higher if you have a worse infection. And that immunity can go away in as few as six to eight months. So just because you've had it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed that you're going to be protected against it. Getting immunized allows your immune system to be reminded about that in a way that produces more antibodies and more of a long-term immune response that can help protect you, particularly if you're at a higher risk. And with, like this caller mentioned, this patient certainly is at a higher risk, don't know what her age is, but um, you know, certainly having diabetes, high blood pressure, and poor circulation, those three things would be high-risk categories. So it is recommended after you recover from having COVID that you get vaccinated uh, or complete your vaccination schedule uh, because that can help protect you against um, future infection. Certainly can't hurt. Getting that booster is not uh, detrimental in any way. It's not gonna reinfect you or uh, cause an inflammatory response that's out of control. Uh, again, it's it's the, really just telling your immune system, hey, we want you to be aware of this coronavirus for the next time that you might be exposed to it. And there are some other vaccines that, you know, we treat the same way. Uh, if we look at adults, certainly the, the pneumonia vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, which we give once at age 65 or in high-risk populations, we may give it earlier. That's something that even if you've gotten pneumonia, it still helps prevent future episodes of pneumonia. Same thing with shingles vaccine. So if you've had shingles before, that doesn't make you immune from the uh, varicella virus that's causing that. So uh, that vaccine can help your body's immune system recognize that in even greater ways to help prevent a future infection. So great question there uh, from our listener. We encourage you again, if you want to email us, the email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. Dr. Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a question uh, before our first break, and that is this. I recently uh, purchased a home monitor, uh, a blood pressure, home monitoring kit, whatever, you know, the cuff and everything, because uh, my doctor wanted me to, you know, send in some readings for over the next couple of weeks. So I've been doing that, but I'm, I'm always uh, worried that I don't, have it attached properly. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's as tight as it needs to be. Um, if you're not putting the cuff on properly, are you in danger of, of getting some results that, that aren't accurate? And, and what would be some tips for making sure you get accurate results? 
Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That's uh, Kevin Farrell, our producer. That's an excellent question, particularly as it relates to blood pressure measurement. So unlike other medical conditions like diabetes or some other conditions where we would actually, you can get a lab test, a blood test uh, that can show you exactly sort of where you are, how well you're treated, blood pressure is one of those things that requires an accurate measurement of the blood pressure. And uh, there is a very uh, well-described way to do that that can help with the accuracy of it. We, we encourage patients to have home blood pressure monitoring. If you can do that, that helps us know what the true blood pressure is out of the office setting, and it gives us more measurement so that we can know what that true mean blood pressure is. But you're right, Kevin, if that cuff is put on incorrectly, if it's too large or too small, uh, what you're doing while you're taking your blood pressure, all those things can affect it and they can affect it uh, falsely elevating the reading or falsely decreasing the reading. So the cuff itself, uh, most cuffs nowadays, they have like a, a measurement that you can take of your arm, and then on the inside of the cuff, they'll, they'll show you, or on the box, they'll actually tell you which one is most appropriate. You can always ask your, your physician's office, uh, you know, what size cuff for my arm would you suggest when you go back to see them? And uh, they can suggest that. So if you use too small a cuff, that reading may be artificially elevated. And the uh, the uh, if it's too big, of course, it would be too low. Uh, now, people say, well, should I get it really tight on my arm or loose? You want it, and, and this depends on which one. Some of them have like a plastic uh, insert in the middle of them that sort of keeps it on your arm. But you want it snug, and most of them have a Velcro closure but you don't want it to over tighten that uh, to begin with. So it should be uh, snug against your arm, but not too tight where it's uh, pinching your skin or it's cutting off blood supply right off the bat. And uh, positioning of that is important too. Your arm needs to be, uh, that cuff on your arm needs to be at the same level as your heart. Doesn't need to be higher or lower than your heart because that may change the blood pressure reading. And then you should be seated with your feet on the floor, uh, not talking. It should be 30 minutes since you um, since you smoked or you ate something. Don't need to be even chewing gum. All these things are the correct way to measure blood pressure. Now, I get it, not, not a whole lot of office settings are like that, but it can affect the blood pressure. And it also helps to get an average of those readings. A lot of blood pressure cuffs now are similar to the ones we use in the office that take an average of three blood pressures with a time period in, in between them of anywhere from one to two minutes. And then the machine will take an average of those three. And that's one of the more accurate ways to take blood pressure. Um, it, particularly those people who have something called white coat hypertension, which is a little bit of an exaggerated stress response to, to anything. Um, and they tend to have, particularly on those first blood pressures in the office and sometimes at home, a little bit higher levels. So. That's what I would do. Your pharmacist um, can help you with that too. So they can show you how to put that on. So you could always take it to them or you could take your blood pressure cuff to your physician's office, which is always a great idea because then you can compare it against the blood pressures that they're getting in the office to make sure it's accurate. Um, but it does, it can change a blood pressure reading anywhere from 20 to 40% in the wrong direction either way if you don't do it correctly. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions about any kind of health care, health care issue that you might have. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring 
That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're going to go to Liz from Moselle. Good morning, Liz. Thank you for calling. What's your question this morning? Thank you, Dr. Jimmy. I'd like to ask you a question about these TENS units that you can buy, like at Walmart or Amazon or anywhere. Are are they any good? Yeah, a TENS unit is uh, in some, it electrically stimulates the skin and the tissues underneath that, and they're very useful for different musculoskeletal conditions that sort of loosen up the muscle there, and it can help with chronic pain, particularly in the back or in around your big joints. So they are very useful. Now the over-the-counter ones are not quite the same, so they're gonna they're not gonna be able to get down as deeply as some of the other ones. Um, I'm not aware, just off the top of my head, about the you know the the value of of the ones that you can get over the counter. But I knew, do know overall they're not quite as good as some of the other ones that you can get. I would check with your physician about that, or if you're seeing a physical therapist, they have some expertise there as well. Um, they can prescribe that, and if you know, for most insurances, if you have that, they will pay for that if it's recommended by a physician or recommended by the physical therapist. But I, my general understanding is that those tens units that you can get at you know just sort of over the counter at the at the pharmacies, they're not quite as good as the other ones. It sort of depends on what you're what you're treating, but um, they may provide some, uh, you know, some improvement and things. But you may want to check with uh, with a physical therapist or with your physician first. Well, I'm, I, I I had physical therapy once before, and he used the tens unit in conjunction with moist heat. And of course, these portable ones, you can't, you know, it's just the electrical stimulation. Right. Um, but uh, I am seeing a pain doctor, and I was uh, – I'll, I'll just ask him when I see him Wednesday. Yeah, I think they would they would be able to weigh in uh, even more than I have and say, you know, whether they think it would be good or not. You're right, a, com- a combination of things. What you're really trying to do is to manipulate the neural input around that part of your body so that your brain doesn't interpret the pain that it's getting – and sometimes a combination of heat and moist heat just it penetrates a lot better than dry heat. Like a heating pad usually doesn't work as much as either immersion or uh, yeah, moist that, heat. Yeah, that's what surface. he said, and 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 I tried it. So I I, I yeah. well, I mean, I'm not with the tens, but I tried, you know, just a heating pad, and no, it does not work. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, a lot of people will say, you know, if you get in the shower and you have that water, you know, at the right temperature, you want to be careful if you're doing that. You don't get it too hot. But, um, but yeah, moist heat always penetrates a little bit better than just than dry heat. Mhm, mhm. Okay. Well, thank you. You answered my question. I'll, I'll, I'll ask the pain man. All right. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thanks for calling. We're gonna go to Bill from Greenville. Good morning, Bill. What's your question this morning? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, back in 1961, I was nine years old, and I went to the clinic, had a penicillin shot, and as soon as I had it, I passed out. I quit breathing for about like 10 minutes back there. They didn't have any fibrillators or anything. All the doctor did was give me smelling sauce, and after about 10 minutes, I started breathing again. I guess I died. I, I don't know, and and he finally revived me. He said he thought he'd lost me, but the uh, uh, fact is, I'm pretty sure I'm allergic to penicillin, and I've asked several doctors and my own doctor about it, and they said, well, you know, if you get the COVID shot, it doesn't matter if you're allergic to penicillin or not because uh, people uh, used to, uh, just imagining things that, you know, penicillin does not really give you a, a, a reaction. And uh, some my, my other doctor said that, uh, you know, that uh, – it didn't really make any difference. What do you think? If I'm allergic to penicillin, should I get the COVID uh, virus? You know, is, yeah, is, yeah. Is, 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 I could kill me. I don't know. Yeah, so that's a great question, Bill. So uh, allergies to antibiotics, which penicillin is an antibiotic, um, is one of the earlier ones that were developed, and uh, it can be a real thing. Um, now, you know, we always, we know now that there are differing levels of allergies. So sometimes... If a kid is treated with, you know, say for an ear infection with penicillin uh, in our penicillin-like medication, 
uh, they may get a rash. Well, that's not a true allergy to it. It can be, the rash could be from the penicillin, but it also could be from whatever illness is going on with them. Um, it's, you know, and, and from the symptoms, the, 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 your description of what happened, you know, that could be a serious uh, complication and a true allergy to penicillin. Thankfully, now that doesn't mean that you're allergic to other antibiotics. So there's plenty of other types of antibiotics that you can get. Um, that are not going to cross-react with that. And the COVID vaccines, all of them, they don't have anything to do with penicillin. So they weren't manufactured using penicillin. They don't have penicillin in it. Penicillium is a, is a, or penicillin is a derivative of a mold, actually. So they noticed that on Petri dishes where they would grow bacteria, that there were certain molds that if it developed on that dish where the bacteria was growing, the bacteria would die or be inhibited uh, right up next to it. So they studied that, they purified it, and they actually, you know, developed this antibiotic, which saved just thousands and thousands of people's lives. And from that, they've uh, developed other antibiotics in different, uh, in the same class or in different classes. But just because you've got, I would say, I would still tell people, yes, if you had a penicillin allergy, they're probably going to ask you what happened. You can tell them like, just like you did me, but that shouldn't have any bearing on uh, any other vaccine or injectable antibiotic that's not in that same class as penicillin. Well, that's good because I haven't had the shot yet, and I want to get the Johnson & Johnson, but uh, they don't have it here. And uh, so uh, I'm worried about, you know, now it's even worse. Uh, why are so many young kids dying instead of older people, do you know? So it has to do with the particular variant. We don't know all of the reasons behind that, but it seems to affect younger individuals more. You know, the first round, we really didn't see that. It was really over the age of 65 uh, and up were the, the ones that were hit the hardest. But this particular variant of it does affect younger individuals in worse ways. So, you know, right now in our hospital, we've got uh, several patients that are in their 20s and 30s that are on high flow oxygen. They're on, not in the ICU, not in a, on a ventilator. Hopefully they won't get that direction, but that's still a very serious, uh, you know, uh, complication of the infection. But we don't, we don't know why that is, that whatever changes in the Delta variant that happened made it more contagious. So it's about four times as, as contagious. Um, you know, you're old enough to remember chicken pox and how contagious it was. And people had chicken pox parties where you'd bring your kids and everybody in the room would get it. That's how <laughs> contagious this, this Delta variant is. Uh, so yeah. it's just as contagious as chicken pox. So it's got a little bit different differences, but that's viruses. They do some weird stuff. And if you've got this many people worldwide that are getting it, every time it, it replicates, every time that it reproduces itself in you have the, you know, the chance of it changing over time. So, um, yeah, I, I, Bill, I'd, I'd still, you know, try to investigate and see what the availability is, but you shouldn't have any cross-reactivity between the penicillin and any of those vaccines. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. I feel a lot better. Thank you. All right, Bill, you take care. Thanks for calling. Dr. Jimmy, got this another is... caller on the line. Let's uh, visit sure. next with uh, Tom, okay. who's listening Tom. from Brandon, I believe. Okay. Good morning, Tom. How are you this morning? Uh, fine, Dr. Jimmy. Good morning. Uh, just a quick follow-up question from Kevin's uh, uh, asking about blood pressure. If you have a fairly well-developed bicep and you put the cuff around the bicep, is that going to give you a higher reading than it would if you just had it a little lower? Only if you flex those guns while you're taking the blood pressure. So if you're, um, yeah, if you are relaxing, it doesn't really matter. You could be Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. And if you had an appropriate, now you probably would have to have a bigger cuff for the circumference of the, of the arm at that point. Uh, but yeah, the, the, and the reason is the artery is fairly close to the surface. So it's not like it's inside the bicep and it's actually down near your elbow at the bottom is where it's measuring that. So, and that gets sort of transmitted through all those tissues. Same kind of thing with, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of people, their arms will be a little bit bigger because of adipose or obesity uh, tissue. Um, that's the same kind of thing. As long as that cuff is the right size and you're not, you're not 
flexing your arm while you're doing it. If you tense up, yeah, it's probably going to throw the whole thing off. Uh, so you do need to relax while you do that. But if you work out, you got a big bicep or triceps, don't want to uh, uh, slight the backside of the arm too if you've got big horseshoes on the back of your arm. Uh, but that shouldn't affect the, the reading there. Well, I, I ask because uh, I usually use the uh, machine that they have the cuff that they have where you sit down at the Y and take a blood pressure. And that cuff usually kind of fits just above the elbow. But the last time I was at my uh, doctor's office, they put it up higher on my bicep. And for the first time I had a much higher reading and I, I just was concerned. Yeah. And it, it placement again, even if you're at your doctor's office, um, placement can make a difference. So, it needs to be at least 40% the width of the cuff, 40% of the circumference of the arm, um, and that that uh, and it needs to be midway on your arm. So it doesn't need to be all the way down or over your elbow or all the way up to your shoulder. Actually, the midpoint of the cuff should be. We measure it from from the olecranon to the acromion process. So that's like two bones, one down at the elbow and one up at the shoulder on the outside of the arm. And that's how you can find the midpoint, but it's uh, you know, and the other, the other thing I didn't bring up earlier too, a lot of people will ask me, well, what about wrist cuffs? Wrist cuffs are not as accurate. They've made some improvements in those, but again, you have to get it at the level of the heart. There's much more variability there. You can have small movements in your hand that throw that thing off. And uh, it's just not as accurate as the cuff on the arm. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, Tom, I, I think, and don't, don't be scared by one single blood pressure either. So a lot of people will say, well, I took my blood pressure out, you know, at the Y or at my physician's office and it was 160 over a hundred, but all the other times that I've taken it, it's, it's fine. It's 120 over 75. Then I, then the correct answer is don't be worried about that one. That's abnormal. It probably was from an inaccurate measurement. Or your blood pressure could have gone that high at that moment. So one blood pressure does not equate having hypertension. One high blood pressure does not equate in having hypertension. So the more readings you get, the more you get sort of this this idea of what the true blood pressure is throughout the day. And that can change about 20%. Okay. Well, I thank you. I appreciate the show. Oh, thank you, Tom. We appreciate your call. And uh, that's a great follow-up question. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Slowly we started, you know, picking these turtles up and saving them. I'll stop traffic, grab one out of the road. And then our friends found out and our vet would call us. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. We are now a full-fledged, nonprofit turtle rescue. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your calls and questions. Got some great ones so far. You can reach us right now by calling 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. Or if you're not able to reach us by phone today, you can always send us an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. We do have a caller on the line, Dr. Jimmy. So next we're going to say good morning to Renee calling in from Utica. Good morning, Renee. What's your question this morning? Yes, good morning. I would like to know LDL of a 34. Is that too low? Uh, did you say 34? Yes. Yeah. That's ex are you on medication to decrease cholesterol like a statin or No, actually it's not me. I have a brother that's just say he's fifty years old and he doesn't uh -huh. take any medicine for it to decrease it. 
Yeah, that is an excellent LDL. We should back up a little bit. You probably know what this means, but um, so cholesterol is made up of different components. And of course, we check cholesterol in individuals. Actually, now we we screen higher risk children um, and adults uh, to try to prevent sort of the downstream effects of excess cholesterol, which are, of course, stroke, a heart attack, and other um, other hardening of the arteries and other regions of the body. So. Um, but it does have different components. So the total cholesterol doesn't tell you the whole picture, right? So it's, it's, it's useful, but it's, it's not as useful as having all those components. And the major players, there are actually like a dozen different components in uh, cholesterol, but the ones we usually target uh, is uh, LDL cholesterol that you mentioned, Renee, and um, that's low-density lipoprotein. But I like to think about it as lousy, okay, L for lousy. So this is the bad cholesterol. So this is the one that causes the most problems if it's high. And by high, optimal readings on anybody would be less than 100. Uh, 100 to 130 is sort of, uh, you know, normal but close to, to having some risk. Uh, and then the other thing we know now is it's not all about the cholesterol. It's about the other risk factors. So if you smoke, you have diabetes, your age. So that a cholesterol LDL of 130 at a 70 would have a different risk than a LDL cholesterol of 130 in a 40-year-old. So um, the other types of cholesterol are HDL, and I think of that as healthy. The higher it is, the better. Uh, and then triglycerides are the other major component. And all of these can be caused by different things. Genetics plays a huge uh, role in determining that what you eat and take into your body takes uh, it can affect that, and even exercise to a certain extent can affect your cholesterol, particularly the HDL cholesterol. So the question was, is there an LDL that's too low? So 34 is certainly much much less than 100, which would be optimal. Um, and sometimes you can see that when you're, you're taking medication, uh, particularly the statins, which are the best medications to help prevent. Uh, heart attack and stroke and decreased cholesterol. The two of two of the most common ones of those are a statin or Lipitor or um, Zuvastatin or Crestor. Uh, but there's some others too. But in the you know, and some people have really good cholesterol levels, and without knowing all the other, I'd say this is excellent. Uh, and if you're eating healthy, if you're active. A lot of times you can see patients that have cholesterol profiles that have an LDL in that range have really, 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 really good genetics, then that can be the, you know, a component of it too. So I, that's what I would say. And again, that needs to be plugged into an, an equation that takes into account all those other things, your blood pressure, diabetes, smoking history, uh, and lots of other, see what the total risk for your brother's age is, and then by that, that may mean that they they go on a cholesterol medication or not. Um, but by itself, that that sounds really really good. And you see that if you you know if we didn't eat American food and we sort of ate uh, you know grains, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables, a lot of red meat, what you see in those populations, you don't see cholesterol LDLs that are very high. Okay, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, now, this is concerning me. Last year, my um, LDL was 104. When I went to the doctor this year, it said 124. So is that possible? It jumped that quick. I've changed nothing. I exercise and try to eat to the best of my ability. So that's yeah. So yeah. possible. Yeah. Were you, were, were you fasting? Were, did, when you, uh, were you fasting for at least six hours on the, both of those? Yeah, for a whole day. I didn't eat, you know. Yeah. Oh, goodness. That was more than enough. Um yeah, it can be that different uh, in a year, and there's a lot of factors that might go into that. Um, you know, I it, uh, and again, 124 for yourself, that would need to be plugged in to the numbers just to sort of see what your total risk was. But uh, I've seen it vary that much, and, you know, I ask my patients, has anything changed? They may not have gained any weight. Their activity, their diet may be the same. There are some foods that might can elevate that that are a little bit higher in cholesterol, but generally, if you don't have big swings in your diet and you fast appropriately before you get the test, which is, again, at least six hours, um, then it's fine. You know, it, does, it should be pretty accurate. 
Um, the other thing that sometimes can affect that is your triglyceride levels. So higher triglyceride levels will make it a little bit more difficult to measure that LDL. But I would say, you know, that needs to be a discussion with your physician about whether or not, you know, that one reading, they may want to check that again in a couple of months just to see if that was, you know, something that was a little bit uh, just a, an outlier of what your true LDL cholesterol is. Um, and another thing that a lot of people will say, well, don't you need to treat that if it's 124 and my risk is high? How we treat that really is, is decreasing your risk over a 10-year period. So, um, in other words, if we do, there is a little bit of time. You don't want to blow it off for years, but um, being on a statin for that risk reduction, you can, you have some time to let people, you know, try to change some things or maybe repeat something in four to six weeks just to see if it's changed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for calling. Those are excellent questions. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Um, other things, you know, that you think about, I know I just saw my physician um, for an annual checkup, and like a lot of other people, we were putting some things on the back burner, but certainly you don't want to do that long term. I know, uh, you know, directly getting COVID is a, is a bad thing, but there's also other things that you need, particularly in a prevention uh, category that can help you not get sicker or, or have sort of the, the long-term complications. Thankfully, cancer, you know, is a big killer in the United States. Um, there's a lot of people that are affected by that, even if it doesn't, uh, if it's not something that's going to be, uh, that's going to take your life, it may impact it in big ways. And uh, we do know that earlier we diagnose cancers, the better your outcome uh, as a whole. So the, the earlier we can help identify those, the better. And a lot of the screening techniques that we have for the various cancers, some of those are lab tests, some of those are tests like colonoscopies, mammograms, uh, PSAs. There's, there's lots of different ways that we can, we can test for those depending on what your risk is and your age is. But uh, don't uh, neglect that. Even if you're doing things, I know there's a lot more ramp up right now with telehealth uh, visits. Uh, don't be scared about that. Try that out. Your physician can, can uh, you know, really engage with you on that to make sure that that's not being missed. The other thing is other vaccinations uh, or um, other labs to, to monitor things. There's other ways to do that. It's one of the, the good things that's grown out of COVID is we've been able to extend out. You don't have to come to the physician's office for everything. You can extend out how we interact with patients and sometimes over the phone or uh, by a video call uh, can certainly uh, can certainly bridge the gap with some of these things. So if you've been delaying some things or if you've noticed something that's changed, whether that's a change in your bowel movements, if it's a change in something that's in your skin, let your physician know about it. Even right now, uh, there are lots of, uh, there may be a little bit of a delay, but you don't need to delay it too long so that you have bad complications down the road. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your calls and uh, questions 
about uh, lots of different healthcare issues this morning. Uh, if you weren't able to call in today, do send us an email. That email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. I'm going to go to Larry now in Boonville. Good morning, Larry. What's your question that you have this morning? Well, Doc, I was listening to your program, and I sure like it, and it's a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And I was listening to the uh, one that's talking about cholesterol, uh -huh. and uh, so mine was up like in the 300s. And so uh, the doc prescribed something for me, and uh, so I got, I got it. But I started using fish oil. Mm -hmm. Before I, I would I would take the four, uh, four capsules, a thousand milligrams per day, two in the morning, two in the evening, and taking Metromucil. And I, and uh, when I went back from a checkup, it was well eighty six. Well, when he tested that time, but it was double that. So he mm -hmm. asked me what I was doing. I told him. He said that was helping pull down the cholesterol. So I thought I'd put that in the line and tell them what I'd done to pull my cholesterol down. It brought it down to uh, 86, and he said that was good. So uh, it might help somebody along the line. Yeah, and that's probably, you know, fish oil is something that I have suggested with some of my patients, particularly for that component of triglycerides. So, you know, we said there's different types of cholesterol within that total number, um, now, it doesn't help the LDL cholesterol, really, uh, certainly changing your diet and other things. And Metamucil, I'm guessing that that sort of bound up cholesterol, because if you increase fiber by any means in your diet, whether you're taking Metamucil or if you're just eating lots of foods with fiber, that's usually going to lower your cholesterol some, too, um, overall. But, the uh, you know, at 300 amount, that's probably triglycerides, and that makes perfect sense. Um, the amount of fish oil that you mentioned, that's about the same amount that I would, uh, you know, recommend somebody to take uh, for that. You do have to, you do have to sort of, uh, you know, you do have to repeat it and, and make sure, and you have to keep taking it that way too to keep it down. But a lot of people can do that, particularly for the triglyceride component. LDL, again, it doesn't quite respond to that, um, to the fish oil. And in in the higher doses of fish oil, you can actually raise LDL a little bit. Uh, but it sounds like that's working for you. You know, if the repeat numbers are fine, probably was represented more of triglycerides that were high. Um, and uh, certainly that fiber from the Metamucil uh, can help uh, with, uh, with decreasing that. You know, in patients that, that have other problems, if they have constipation, and they have triglycerides or cholesterol that's high, that can oftentimes be a, a good uh, medication to hit both of those things at the same time. So, Larry, thanks for, for sharing that. That's really good uh, info for, for those. And, you know, it, it, I do want to, you know, uh, emphasize that point, though. It's, you know, there's different types of cholesterol within that total number. So you do need to know those, and your physician needs to be comfortable with um, with how to navigate that so that they can put you on exactly what you need to, to be on. Um, and incidentally, fish oil was looked at uh, initially just because, not just because somebody was taking it, but in populations that um, had a larger amount of natural oily fish intake, um, those are usually cold water fish, they noticed that their uh, triglyceride levels and cholesterols were a lot lower and they tended to have less heart disease, too. So, um, you know, you do have to look at all the things going on. They also had very, you know, high fiber intakes. Uh, all those things can certainly help uh, to get that down. And, you know, I mentioned, too, the genetics around cholesterol can be pretty powerful. There's a lot. Of, and if you're, you know, there's some uh, family histories where everybody in the family has high cholesterols. Maybe triglycerides are in the thousands, not even 300s, but a thousands. Those are situations where it's going to take major medications to get that down, and diet is probably not going to be the whole picture there uh, just because of how high it is. Um, but you do need to look at sort of the whole picture, and I encourage my patients to do that too. To, it's not just one thing that you can take or, or you know, one uh, – everybody would love to do that. What's the one thing I can take and I'll fix all my problems? But oftentimes it's multiple things. 
And if you really can have a base of trying to eat better and exercise better if you can, um, those things can be very powerful added to other medications or even over-the-counter things that you're taking. So um, that's an excellent point there, Larry, about, you know, what you're taking. I'm glad that's working for you, too. Um, this is uh, Southern Remedy, the number to call if you have a – well, actually, we got about two minutes, don't we, Kevin? So uh, I think – do we have anybody on the line right now? No, but, Dr. Jimmy, I opened the question, so maybe I could wrap up with a quick one, and that is that uh, sure. I kind of foolishly went out and mowed my yard yesterday thinking that it was later in the afternoon, so it had cooled off a little bit, and it uh, we all know it probably hasn't. We're in uh, on store for another big heat wave what are the signs that you really need to pay attention to in the heat to know, hey, I need to immediately quit this activity, get some shade, get some water, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up because we have had some really high heat numbers, heat-related indexes um, that have been way over 100. So if you notice, if you're out and doing activities, first of all, prehydrate before you even get out there. Make sure you're drinking plenty of water before you get out there. And then drink frequently every 10 to 15 minutes. Don't wait till you feel like you need to, you're thirsty. Um, and then take some frequent breaks, sort of break up that activity. But the warning signs would be if you feel, if you stop sweating, if you feel dizzy or lightheaded or are confused in any kind of ways, uh, if you have a severe headache, um, if you're nauseated, those are all the warning signs that you may have some volume loss and some electrolyte changes that may be impacting uh, your health in negative ways. So the best thing to do in those situations are to come inside, cool yourself off, um, again, the, uh, with a cool towel or just, uh, you know, in a, in a room that has air conditioning in it. Uh, that would be the best thing to do. There are cooling stations in a lot of different cities and counties in Mississippi that have been set up so that you can stop off there and get cooled if you don't have access to that at your house. So those are some of the warning signs, and, and if you have other illnesses, and particularly if you're taking medications like diuretics, you want to be extra careful out in the uh, in the heat, and just break those activities up. You don't have to spend the whole hour out there. Break it up into 10, 15 minutes a couple of times a day or at the, at the bookends of the day, as I call them, the early morning and late evening so that you can avoid those effects. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at MPB 